Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you all, even if it has to be virtual today. Uh, I want to talk to everyone today about something that is near and dear to my heart and something that I believe is critical for all of us to continue to iterate on and improve to make the world of software a better place. And that is commercial open source software business models. Now, making open source sustainable and able to keep the lights on has been a challenge for software developers for many, many years. There's an almost limitless number of models offering professional services or technical support, uh, providing an easy to use SaaS version of the software, and many, many other methods have been tried, some more successful than others. Today, we're going to focus on what has worked and what hasn't worked for GitLab over our life so far as a commercial open source software company. And I'll talk about how we landed on what we call buyer-based open core. First, a little bit about our story, as I, I think it's relevant to the twists and turns that brought us to our current model. In 2011, DZ, Dimitri, who wrote GitLab originally, he had two problems. He didn't have running water at home in Ukraine, and he didn't have a tool to collaborate with his fellow developers at work. Uh, to hear our CEO tell it, he solved the most pressing problem first, and he wrote GitLab. He needed something that was like GitHub, but self-contained and able to serve his workplace's needs without placing their code into someone else's cloud. About a year later, in 2012, Sid discovered GitLab and thought it made a lot of sense. A tool that developers use to collaborate being open source so they can collaborate directly on the tool itself. Seeing an opportunity, he got in touch with DZ and asked if it would be okay if he stood up a SaaS version, gitlab.com. DZ said, of course, it's open source. You can do whatever you want. Company legend has it that a year or so after that, Sid saw DZ tweet, I wish I could just work on GitLab full time and called him and offered him a job doing just that. Uh, they started growing the business together and eventually Sid would move to San Francisco for Y Combinator, which is a business accelerator program. And in 2015, in fact, the entire team went to San Francisco for Y Combinator back when that team could fit into one large SUV. After graduating from Y Combinator in 2015, Sid took the next logical step that every startup did and leased an office. And the first office was at 1233 Howard Street in San Francisco. But a funny thing started happening. People stopped showing up for work. For example, our first salesperson, Hayden, uh, I let you guess who the salesperson is here in this picture. Uh, poor sales relegated to the folding table up there in the corner. Well, he had a long commute from across the bay in Alameda, California. It's about 15 miles away. And so it takes about 30 minutes in the middle of the night or an hour and a half if you decide to go at the wrong time. The company's work was getting done increasingly through tools like Slack, Google Hangouts, and later Zoom, and GitLab itself. That commute wasn't adding value to Hayden getting his job done, and it wasn't adding value to the company. So this was also the last office. GitLab quickly went to an all remote model. Sid and his wife lived above this office until the lease ran out, and then the office was no more. And now we have over 1,250 team members in 65 different countries and regions, and GitLab still has exactly zero offices. If you wanna mail us something now, we do have a box in a UPS store on Mission Street. My name is Brendan O'Leary, and I live on the East Coast of the US. If I had to commute to Howard Street, it would arguably be, arguably be even worse than Hayden's commute was. I'm a senior developer evangelist for GitLab. And while I wasn't there for the early days of uh, the GitLab van or even a GitLab office, I've been working with, for GitLab uh, since 2017 when we were only about 150 team members. Over that time, I've gotten to see tremendous growth in both GitLab, the product, 
and GitLab the company. Today, GitLab is a single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. The product spans the whole breadth of DevOps from planning what you want to build to storing and collaborating on code, the Git in our name, all the way to configuring and monitoring and defending your actual environments. Along with the product, I've gotten to see the company grow exponentially. Throughout this growth, we've remained true to our open source roots. Our model allows us to deliver substantial business value to our customers and our users, while also attracting a vast community with thousands of contributors who average, average hundreds of improvements in our code in every monthly release. This model is also strengthened by our values. Those values spell credit and are something we talk about constantly as an organization. For each value, we have paragraphs of subvalues that help describe what we mean. For example, efficiency here doesn't just mean do more with less. It means to be efficient for the right group. Iteration and transparency aren't just aspirational ideas. They're how we ship with a low level of shame and invite the wider community to help us build the product and the company to be the best that they can be. In fact, our entire handbook is publicly available and it's Creative Commons licensed. You can actually fork the company if you want to. At GitLab, the community of customers and users <clears throat> are co-creators of the product with us. And what we hear from them is that they're attracted to GitLab both by our product and our values. GitLab is GitLab's transparency, rather, is one of the best tools for attracting new community members. Our contributors have helped us to build the best possible DevOps tool for every industry and vertical where software now reigns supreme. But I also know that that picture I just painted oversimplifies not only our journey, but the variety of challenges that commercial open source companies face as they balance their go-to-market strategy with their open source and community roots. And I think one of the biggest challenges that cost companies face today is how to deal with and survive in the age of the hyper clouds. Time and again, we've seen hyper clouds successfully in many cases, employ a technique of service wrapping. Enterprises and businesses of all sizes want to leverage the best open source tools available, but very few have the scale or desire to run those open source tools, make them highly available, keep them up to date, and learn what it takes to scale them. This is where the hyper clouds have a considerable advantage. To offer those customers the same interfaces and open source software that developers want to use, but with all of the ease of deployment and SLAs that come with a hosted service. In many cases, this can end up directly competing with a cost company's plans for making their own businesses sustainable through SaaS offerings. For instance, the creators of Apache Kafka founded Confluent to be a hosted version of Kafka, but that same kind of service may already exist or even be cheaper in a hypercloud like AWS or Azure. MongoDB saw a similar thing happen to their database and an explosion of alternative services and databases. This pattern has been repeated over and over again. And the standard response for many cost companies has been to change their licenses. <clears throat> this is a trying to find a way to create, you know, an open source license while also preventing competition with their own SaaS offerings. And suffice it to say that these companies have seen backlash from commercial and open source advocates alike. Mongo famously submitted their server side public license to the open source initiatives approval process, and then withdrew it as controversially swirled. Even without that level of drama, there's a broad mix of reactions to this methodology from open source communities, and it's not always friendly. Now, I could spend a whole presentation on this particular topic, but I know better than to try and define open source. Um, I'll probably just end up offending everyone. But let's assume for a minute that even given the possibility of bad press and the possible harm to the community, that these were still the best choice for those companies. 
the hyper clouds still have another card they can play. And we've already seen that happen. Uh, the hyper clouds have the kind of scale where if they don't like the change, they can fork your project at the last fully open source release and maintain a separate line from that point on. And that's precisely what AWS did, partnered with Netflix and Expedia, when Elastic changed the license on Elasticsearch from the Apache 2 license to their new Elastic license. They created the open distro for Elasticsearch, which then created a bifurcated ecosystem. And in many ways, Elasticsearch is an almost perfect candidate to be forked and commoditized in this way. While the technical implementation of how Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kobana come together makes perfect sense, it also has in it inherent some of the things that make a project more likely to be commoditized. With interaction mostly through an API, users and buyers who may be more price sensitive and be open source contributors themselves, those type of open source projects have a low bar to the fork and commoditize strategy. Whereas if your product relies on proprietary features, a user interface for most of the interaction, and has use cases that extend to price insensitive buyers, it's much less likely that your project will be easy to commoditize. Now, how we got to that conclusion comes not from a single momentary epiphany, but from years of finding our own way in the maze that is commercializing open source software. We only landed on our current buyer-based open core model after many, many iterations and failures with other models. When they first started, Sid and DZ went the most altruistic way possible, donations. However, that was not a very profitable way. DZ even made up his own version of ramen profitability here called ice cream money. The money that GitLab was making off donations was enough for DZ and his wife to go out on the weekends and have ice cream. They then went the professional services route. Consultancy is an excellent business, but it has an inverse incentive when you're also a software business. The easier you make it, uh, make your software to install, maintain, the fewer people want to buy your consultant services. And support has a similarly lousy incentive. The better the software is, the less likely someone's going to need to pick up the phone and call you in a given year. And at the end of their term, they'll say, well, why do we even need this? Paid development sounds terrific, but is much less reliable. And what we found is if we had a customer request a feature and then another customer requested the same thing, well, on the surface, that seems like a good thing. You can tell both of them, they get to pay only half of what you thought it would take. But in reality, they'll both pull a prisoner's dilemma on you and try to wait for the other company to pay for the whole thing. Looking more at a SaaS play, data was considered, but the reality is that it's not a data intense business. And with folks self-hosting GitLab, they're less likely to want to send their data back home to you. With a pure SaaS play, we found that self-manage was more valuable because that's one of the main reasons folks would come to GitLab over GitHub to keep their data and their code in their own hands. Based on that, we considered and even did run a single tenant managed service for some time. But that's a tricky business and, and one that didn't scale in the same way that our core business of licensing to self-managed customers did. And because of that, it just wasn't the right investment for us at that time. Now, we never tried a hardware or appliance play. For us, I think that would have had a lot of the same issues we'd seen in a pure SaaS play. Most of our large enterprise customers don't want to put all of their code into a black box. And Sid also likes to point out that we didn't try an initial coin offering, mostly because he wants to avoid jail time and the US SEC's wrath. Now, all of these failures led us to decide that the more traditional focus on open core, where there are high margins on software sales, was the model that would scale for our customers and us in a mutually beneficial way. But even that decision doesn't bring us to the end of our story when it comes to iterating on our business model. And that's because in and of itself, open core doesn't tell you what to do next. 
open core can itself be tricky, uh, a tricky model to get right and uh, align it with the correct value proposition and understand how to balance the open source stewardship of your project with the ability to sustain the model. We first tried to do this across the stages that I showed you earlier. Maybe everyone wants source code management, but then the releases and security stages can be in the paid versions. But everyone of course wants secure software and it's not great to try and tout the benefits of an end-to-end -end system and then put a paywall right in the way of the user getting from end to end. Company size is sometimes an easy proxy for what they're willing to invest directly in a product. But still again, small companies want capabilities that other large companies wish for as well. The same is true if you attempt to slice the market based on maturity. Maybe less mature companies won't need as much. But once again, if GitLab's value proposition revolves around helping users to up their DevOps maturity, putting a paywall there is pretty disingenuous. That's how we finally came to the buyer of the tools and the features that that buyer needs as the key differentiator that worked for us. And after all those evolutions, we finally landed on our business model, which we call buyer-based open core. That is a standard open core license but certain features are paid, placed into paid tiers based on the personas that would be likely the likely buyer for those types of components and features. Breaking that then down into a simple good, better, best tier makes a lot of sense as well. For GitLab, this does result in a 5X escalation in the price between tiers. And that in turn leads to a 25 times difference between the lowest and highest pricing tier tier. While on the surface, that can seem quite large, our, <clears throat> our target buyer changes quite a bit as well. In the lower tiers, we're talking about individuals and small teams. And in the highest tiers, a buyer would more likely be an executive at a large Fortune 500 company. So this has been successful for us, though it does necessitate a hybrid sales strategy with enterprise sales motions at the highest level, and self-service traditional SaaS-like interactions for the lowest tiers. Now, that is also relatively necessary for GitLab given our mix of traditional SaaS and also self-managed installations. So this sales mix may be different for different kinds of businesses and it could change for us over time as well. As you know, enterprises warm up to the idea of SaaS-based code storage. In fact, the whole model is subject to change of course as our product and our market evolve. But our current setup gives us a lot of latitude in terms of our sales model, while also making the decisions about feature tiering much more straightforward with a defined model based on who is the likely buyer. But almost as importantly, we believe this model is more resistant to the fork and commoditize motions that we discussed earlier. If we look at what attributes we assign to projects that were less likely or more likely to be commoditized, we can see that buyer-based open core principles align perfectly to answer these concerns and attributes. Executives needs are often much more complex, which results in a large number of proprietary features to explore to meet their complex needs. They're also more likely to prefer user interface and visualization over just interacting with the project through an API. And of course, if you're able to deliver value to executives, their price sensitivity is much less than other buyers or individual developers. This sets up success for such a model. And I wanna dig a little deeper here because that user interface and the concept of application software versus infrastructure software is also apparent in the success GitLab has seen with this business model. Applications that have a graphical user interface component typically drive much less compute usage than an infrastructure software will. In the age of SaaS, uh, application software lends itself to that kind of multi-tenant design. Whereas unless you are a hyperscaler yourself, you're gonna see a desire for single tenant style managed services on the infrastructure side. Another benefit of application software here is a whole set of contributors 
front end experts, designers, and others who can contribute a lot more to a piece of application software than they necessarily can with infrastructure software, which might have you know little user interface and maybe very few uh, user uh, UX kind of considerations. So if you look at all of those considerations from the perspective of, of the hypercloud, you'll see that not only is it harder to commoditize projects with this model, it's also much less attractive. Typically, when a hypercloud goes to adopt and maybe even fork and commoditize, excuse me, an open source project, it's to create a managed service. That's the value prop for a hypercloud to its customers. And as part of that, the motivation will be to drive compute usage as that's the revenue model of the hyperscalers. Now, that's not to say that uh, buyer-based open core application software or even knock on wood, Git, wood GitLab is wholly protected from someone's desire to fork and commoditize it. But as you look at the long history of these changes, you'll see that many of these defenses, especially when applied in depth, have a twofold benefit to commercial open source companies. It allows them to create a more resistant model to the service wrapping, um, to the service wrapping motions that we saw before, than almost any other open core commercial open source model allows you to, while also positioning the business to take full advantage of co-creation of features with their customers and community alike. Hopefully, as we move into the next decade of open source. Sharing these lessons learned will help other commercial open source companies find their way. I genuinely believe that open source is the way to build software and that if we can simultaneously create sustainable, self-sustaining models, we'll see even more adoption and benefits. Surely there will always be large players in the software business, but we've seen time and again how startups and the little people can disrupt that status quo and I have faith that there will continue to be things that surprise all of us. To quote Donna in the series finale of Halt and Catch Fire, no matter what you do, someone is around the next corner with a better version of it. And sometimes that person is you. The you that's never satisfied with what you did just because you're obsessed with whatever is next. The one constant is this, it's you. It's us, the project gets us to the people. Thank you all so much for your time today. I'm honored to have had the opportunity to speak to you about something that I care so deeply about, and I'd love to discuss it even more. Uh, hopefully you have some questions uh, that you can add into the question and answer section uh, or into the chat. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me after today, the best way is on the Twitters. Uh, I'm at O'Leary Crew. I also do occasionally check my email, uh, so that's also here as well. Uh, would love to discuss that more with you. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, Brendan. And I can see one question from Matt Wigney. Do you find that it's more difficult to upsell to the next higher pricing tier since there's a fairly large price bumped between them? Uh, so I would say generally, yes, right? Like I think the large, you know, I, I could spend a, a lot of time talking about that, but the large bump in price is something that is, um, it's tough because there's this concept of, uh, is it 5X the value? And then also, um, you know, does that mean the, the lower tier is less valued? So it's something we're always thinking about. Um, I would say that the, the biggest difference I would say, yes, it's more difficult to upsell, but what we find is as folks kind of adopt more and more of GitLab, let's say they, you know, we're using GitLab for just source control. Yeah, maybe it's harder to upsell them, uh, but if they're also doing CI, CD and want security um, tooling, then all of a sudden GitLab becomes a much more critical tool uh, for, for the company. And, uh, and that kind of leads just naturally to the buyer going up and then again the price sensitivity going down uh so I, I would not say that it's i would say that it is more difficult uh, but we found it to be the right the right choice for us 
All right, thank you for that. And from Brittany, thanks for a fantastic talk. Really well executed. I'm curious to hear more about your sales models. Does GitLab have a self-service like automated billing for all of the propriety features? Are there some features that are only available when engaging with a sales team? That's a great question. Um, so I would say, yes, we do have self-service for all of the tiers. So for instance, um, we, so we, we kind of have, I, did, I, I had a slide that was really complex that I took out, um, but showed, cause we, we also have this kind of uh, two different ways to buy GitLab, right? You can buy GitLab on gitlab.com where we host and manage it as a SaaS for you, uh, or you can buy GitLab and, and self-manage it yourself right in your own cloud or maybe on premises. Um, and we price those the same. Um, and then you can actually sign up for any of those tiers online um, through our customer portal. Now, having said that, you know, at the highest tiers, um, we're talking about a, you know, a, a transaction that folks are going to want to probably put a purchase order, get a software agreement in place, right. And so those typically are going to be a large enough transaction that folks don't typically just sign up online for. Um, but if it's a small enough team that sees the value in it, it's, it is possible to do. Um, so uh, yes, we allow it, but you know, once you start getting big enough, you're gonna you definitely get a call from us if you don't call us first, <laughs> for sure. All right. And from Luis Pugel, Thank you for the talk, Brandon. Are the slides available somewhere? Great. Yes, I will put a link in here and I'll also tweet them after we drop um, at O'Leary Crew. Hold on, just uh, get in the right chat window here. Um, but they are available and I'll, I will tweet out a link to them as well um, after, after we get off of here because I know that the chat doesn't stick around forever. So a tweet is forever. <laughs> Or close enough. I agree. <laughs> At least we can go visit Twitter again if we need the links. <laughs> yep, for sure, for sure. All right. We don't have any questions so far. And everyone, if you would like to share at least one thing, one takeaway that you have learned today from Brandon, that would be great. So we can have something to read here in the chat. We still have time. We finish early. And we're hoping you're enjoying the conference. It's the last, almost last hours yeah. of this conference. <laughs> so I'm hoping you enjoyed and learned so much. We have, you know, a great line of speakers and sponsors, including you, of course, Brandon O'Leary from GitLab. And yeah, don't forget to share on social media with the hashtag ADO2020. And See, we can uh, entertain one more question here from Matt. Oh, no, not a question. <laughs> yeah, he just said that they uh, they didn't fit in yeah. it. They, there is there is video on the website of them driving in it, actually. Um, I'm just going back to the slide here. Um, our former uh, VP of product, Yob, is the one that's closest to the camera here, and they surprised him uh, with a bachelor party. They they faked him out and said that they were going to an emergency customer meeting with some customer that was really upset. Um, and it turned out they were taking him on a bachelor party um, for his now wife, uh, but at the time he was engaged. So they did fit in it and there's video of it even uh, on the on the website in the <laughs> GitLab uh, company history. If you Google that, you'll see it. Hey, that's a very cool prank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it seems like your internal team have, you know, very great culture inside. That's why outside the GitLab team, the community is really, you know, there for one another and helping the businesses really well. So mm -hmm. good job on that. And it's actually my first to hear the history of GitLab since I'm from the Philippines. So um, community is still at the early stage here sure. in my country. So that's why 
I'm happy to be here with all things open, learning some development and developers and softwares that are very helpful for communities, especially for brands, right? And I don't see any more, I don't see any questions here so far. So do you have any last um, tips or advices for our attendees right now? Um. No, again, I'd say find me on Twitter at O'Leary Crew. Um, and yeah, if you're you're interested in working, we've like I said, we've got folks all over. We have, I think we have like six or seven folks in the Philippines, um, for instance. So we have folks all over the world. Um, and come join us if you're if you're if there's something that interests you. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I would love to know more. <laughs> yeah, if so you go to if you search for um, GitLab, if you go to about.gitlab.com, here I'll send the link. About.gitlab.com slash company slash team, you can actually see a map of where we all are. Um, and so you can you can see all of the the different countries and regions that we we work in. It's actually 66, so I think I said 65 wow. plus, which saved myself. So <laughs> it's a very big team now. It is, it is. Yeah, we were only like I said, we were only about 150 when we start when I started. Um, so I knew everyone, and now I I definitely don't know everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but they know you <laughs> for sure. Well, for sure, for sure. Yes. Well, thanks so much. <laughs>